As human beings, we sometimes forget that in the food chain, we're not the last link. There are other living creatures, bigger and stronger, who would just as soon have us for lunch as wait around for something tastier. One of these creatures is the great white shark, and to escape its powerful jaws can take a miracle. Just south of California's famous Monterey Peninsula is one of America's most unusual state parks, Point Lobos. What makes this state park so unique is that most of it lies underwater. Its coves are a diver's paradise, filled with some of Mother Nature's most spectacular creations, as well as some of her most deadly. On June 30th, 1995, veteran divers Stephen Larson and his girlfriend Marcy Leconte chose Point Lobos Blue Cove to help test their friend Marco Flagg's new invention, a dive tracker. This small device contains a sonar computer that could help divers find their way in dark and murky waters in much the same way as the instruments that help airline pilots locate their bearings during a storm. But today, the waters were far from dark and murky. We had probably 60 or so feet of visibility. And it was real uh, good light. It was, it was a real pleasurable dive. After an hour underwater, the divers decided to take a break, leaving their anchor line in place and heading for shore. They would return later for a second dive. For our second dive, the cloud cover had rolled in, the sun had gone down. Because it was late in the day, we were considering not doing the second dive of the day and, and instead going home. But they ignored their misgivings and headed back into open waters. We pulled the boat up to the buoy, which was the location of our first dive, and we clipped the boat off to that buoy. We all three pretty much hit the water at the same time. And they immediately could see that the conditions had changed. Their visibility was less than 10 feet. The team got separated as soon as we got in the water. The current pulled Steve in one direction, while the motorized scooter Marco was riding took him in another. And Marcy went down the anchor line. The three of us went three different directions. Moments later, they would each experience the same terrifying feeling. I felt as I was descending, I had company. There was something else in the water there with me. I can't see anything, and I felt that the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. But it was Marco who would come face to face with the terror they were feeling. At a depth of 50 feet, he suddenly saw a giant tail fin sweep by. It was a great white shark, and as he struggled to get back to the surface, it closed in for the kill. Marco was helpless as the shark's powerful jaw took his torso in its grip. And then, just as suddenly as he was struck, the shark released him and swam away. Was it preparing for a second strike? Was there blood in the water that would attract more predators? Marco wasted no time returning to the surface and throwing himself into the boat. Marco was safe for the moment but his friends were still in danger. He used the engine to warn them. All of a sudden, I hear the motor of the boat. At that, I, I knew that I had to immediately return to the boat. But Steve's movements were actually putting him in greater danger. The attack profile of a shark is almost always to approach the unwary swimmer from below. Once safely inside the boat, Steve learned that Marco had been attacked by a great white. And there's my girlfriend on the bottom of the ocean, and it doesn't appear that she's coming up. 
Percy! I was frantic, trying to gun the motor and get her to come up and gun the motor. But Marcy was nowhere in sight. And what do you do? Do you get back in the water and try to rescue her? That's crazy. Finally, she surfaced. When I broke the surface, I asked Stephen what was going on. And he said, Mark has been bitten by a great white. I flew into the boat, surprisingly enough, uh, with my dive gear on. Now, with all three divers in the boat, Steve raced for shore. When I looked at Marco in the boat, his wetsuit appeared that it was completely intact, and it was hard to believe that he had been bitten by a great white. Park ranger Jerry Loomis was equally shocked by what he found. When I saw him, I thought to myself, this doesn't look like a shark bite victim, but I said, I heard that there was a shark bite. Can you tell me anything about it? And Marco said to me, I'm the victim. But how had he escaped massive injury? The mystery wouldn't be solved until Marco could be fully examined. First, Dr. Blin Schiedler confirmed that the attack had indeed been made by a great white shark. What clued me in was the fact that he had a bite on, on the one side of his arm across the middle of his abdomen and on his leg. There's no other fish with an 18 inch width that uh, has a mouth that big in this area. This still left the question, what could have possibly stopped this powerful beast from tearing Marco in two? The answer was nothing less than a miracle. Well, Marco had a computer on that covered his chest and it had a tank on that protected his back. When the shark bit him, it bit metal, both top and bottom. Had it, there been no metal there, he'd be dead. The prototype for the dive tracker unit had three nice, neat teeth marks in the keypad on this tracking device. It's a once in a lifetime occasion to be in the water with a great white shark and survive or live to tell about it. Um, it's like being shot at and missed. Marco Flagg had been miraculously saved by his own invention, and he fully intends to keep on diving. His brush with death has only strengthened his desire to live his life to the full. When the day comes that I jump into that old pine box, I want to be able to look back and say, by God, I've had a great life, and not just a careful life. If it was me, and by some miracle I'd live through a shark attack, I think I'd opt for the careful life. How much more excitement do you need to have a great life?